The Word of God is alive and powerful, and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit and the joints and the marrow, and is a critic of the thoughts and intents of the heart. All Scripture is God-breathed and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be mature, thirty furnished into all good works. Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that you thought to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And I always say that the spiritual spin stops right here. Why? Because I really care for you. Let's just take a moment of time to prepare ourselves for the study of God's word through the technique of rebound. I say on, on the screen here, prayer time, time to use Operation Recovery, which is a combination of 1 John 1, 9 and Romans 6, 6, 6, 11, and 6, 13. 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess, that word confess is the word amalageo, and it means to name, to cite, to identify. It's a legal term based upon the fact that Jesus Christ died for us on the cross. So because he's paid for all the sins of the world, he's offered us that forgiveness, and he says, look, just name that sin after salvation now. All you have to do is name the sin, and you receive immediate forgiveness. However, to make an experiential life, you need to make sure that you move on from there to Romans 6, 6, 6, 11, and 6, 13. No reckon, reckon, and yield to God the Holy Spirit. So with your heads bowed and eyes closed, you make your own way with the Lord through the confession of your own personal sins. I'll close out the prayer time, make an announcement, and we'll begin. Father, thank you for another opportunity to teach the Word of God. And I want to pray tonight, first of all, for our uh, Chaplain Steve Haynes, who was subdued by the weather at the, uh, at the racetrack this past weekend, loss of strength, and he's going to recover, I know. And he'll be back next Wednesday if, in fact, the rapture doesn't occur. Now, we want to th thank you, Father, for uh, the, the, the information we're going to teach tonight. And I would pray that every person that is online will take this seriously. Here's the issue. Father, we know that every time we open our mouth with a principle from God's word, from your word, that in fact, we need to consider that. Do we, do we, uh, are we willing to take in the word of God? Are we willing to allow the Holy Spirit to teach us the real meaning, the spiritual meaning of these things? Are we willing to uh, believe what he's teaching us? Are we willing to take this information out and put it on the launching pad of our soul that we might grow after having truth after truth after truth after truth? Father, our desire is to grow from spiritual babyhood to spiritual adolescence, to spiritual self-esteem, to spiritual autonomy, finally to spiritual maturity. And then, Father, I pray that we will uh, abide by your rules, your guidance. I pray, Father, we be obedient in the application to the truth in order to resolve in a better way the angelic conflict. It's up to us because we're human beings and we've been drafted into the conflict. So how are we going to handle that? Teach us tonight in Christ's name. Amen. Well, let me make an announcement uh, uh, after indicating where we're going to go tonight. We're going to continue with Romans chapter 9, part 9, which indicates we've already studied eight parts of uh, Romans 9. We are up to Romans chapter 9, verse 21, and actually we started verse 21 last week, and while this is part 9 of Romans 9, this is part 2 of verse 21. So we're going to continue on and try to finish verse 21 tonight, and then we'll move on from there. Now, with that in mind, uh, let's, let me remind you that this coming Sunday, we'll be meeting at American Pie Pizza, just like we did a month ago. You need to arrive between 9.30 and 9.59. That gives you 29 minutes to get in there, get seated. And I ask you to prepare your menu before you get there. Write your name on a piece of paper. Give the, uh, give the, the menu items that you want, what you want to eat, what you want to drink. And then turn that in to the, to the server when you get there. 
and they will try to have our lunch ready for us and begin to serve by 1115. That gives us about an hour and 15 minutes for fellowship after that. We have about 24 people that have signed up right now to be there, and we're looking forward to seeing you then this coming Sunday. Remember, be there between 930 and 959 and try to have in hand uh, your menu item. If you get there early and you don't have a menu, early pick up the menu and uh, write your uh, items at that point in time. Okay, with that in mind, let's move on to our study tonight. And we're going to look at um, Romans chapter 9, beginning in verse 17, simply as a matter of review. And uh, I will ask that you follow me. Reverse, re, review verses 17 through 20. In verse 17, we saw that unbelieving Pharaoh served God's purpose. Now, do you just go back and think about what we taught about that. Pharaoh was the, uh, was the slave driver of the, of the Israelites for 430 years. And we find that Moses went down to Egypt under God's uh, command. And he was going down there to ask Pharaoh to liberate children. Well, Pharaoh said, uh, Pharaoh said no six times. And in those six times, he hardened. But when the seventh plague came, realizing that God allowed Pharaoh to live longer than that sixth plague and say no six times, continuing to harden his heart, toward the gospel of Jesus Christ. Pharaoh rejected all that, hardening his heart. He says, okay, I'm not going to kill you. I'm not going to take you out of the picture. I'm going to use you to be a catalyst for me to be able to evangelize uh, the world, to bring people to Christ. So we see that unbelieving Pharaoh actually is going to serve God's purpose. But the serving of God's purpose actually began with the seventh plague, moving through the eighth and the ninth and the tenth. Now, moving into verse, uh, verse 18, we find a theological conclusion here. That conclusion says, so then he, that's God the Father, the author of the plan, he has mercy on whom he desires, and he hardens whom he desires. So what we see here is two, two different things here. The idea is that God has created the human race. He created one man, Adam. Eve was a rib. He, from Adam and Eve then, after, after the fall of Adam and Eve in the garden, Adam procreate, and in a fallen condition, every human being that followed being born of Adam right down to today, we are not created in the image of, of uh, Adam. We are born, Genesis 6, we're born in the image of fallen Adam. Now, keep that in mind. So we see then in verse 18, we see that God actually tells us that he has mercy on whom he has mercy, and he hardens those whom he desires. Now, that sort of, that sort of uh, brings up sort of a question that uh, I've heard uh, people uh, ask over the years, and that is, uh, do we really have an option in all this? Well, that's what this study is all about tonight, to show you that in spite of the fact that he says, he has mercy on whom he desires, and he hardens whom he desires. Now, when you know the answer to this question, this is going to give you an opportunity as a royal ambassador or out there in the public square talking to people who casually raise this issue. Well, I'm not really sure I'm saved or not because, you know, God chooses who he's going to send to heaven and who he's going to send to hell. Is that really what this means? The answer is no. So the question is then, what does it mean? But first of all, we have to understand here, theological conclusion is this. God's going to, he's going to have mercy on whomever he wants to have mercy, and he's going to harden the hearts of those whom he desires also. Moving into verse, verse 19, and verse 18, some more up about that in, in just a few minutes. In verse 19, we have 
two debaters question. Paul is going to, he's going to use a debater's technique here. And while he's talking to the Romans who are asking questions about Israel, Paul is going to say, look, let me show you something. And Paul is going to, he's going to, uh, uh, to, uh, to act as though he is in a debate and he realizes his opposition are going to make some sort of kind of arguments that will oppose him. So Paul says, okay, in his mind, he said, here's what I'm going to do. He said, I'm going to raise the question that these people are going to ask. Then I'm going to answer that question from a biblical viewpoint, and this will destroy their argument, and the debate is over before it ever begins. We see two debaters' questions here. In verse 19, he said, you will say to me, what's he gonna, what are they going to say? Why does he still find fault? Second question, or who resists his will? Now, in verse, in verse 20, we see the answer to the first question. And what is the first question? Why does he, that's God, why does God still find fault? Now, you see, I believe that if you stop long enough, and if you've opened your mouth out in the public square to any degree at all, you're going to realize that people have asked you that same question. And here's how it goes. Oh, you say that God is a loving God? God is a loving God? Well, let me ask you a question. If God is a living God, then why did this happen over here? If God is a, is a loving God, why did this happen over here? If God is a loving God, why is this happening to me? Why is it not happening to my neighbor? My neighbor is a, is a scumbag. And he or she just seems as though they have everything going for them. And yet look at me. I'm falling apart with pressure, not falling apart spiritually, but look at the pressures that are caving in on me. If you say that God is a loving God, then how could he allow this to happen to me as a born-again Christian who love him and see this unbelieving person next door look like everything is okay? Well, hello? Verse 20 says, on the contrary, uh, I'm sorry, in verse 19, you will say then, why does he still find fault? Well, in verse 20, we're going to get the answer to that. He said, on the contrary, who are you? Now watch this. On the contrary, when you ask, why does God still find fault? Why is he still? And <laughs> Paul says, wait a minute. Oh, man. Oh, man, what's going on with you? Who are you to think that you answer back to God? Well, that's exactly right. You see, God is God not God. And we're not here to question God. If God has a plan that goes in a certain way, we are not here to question that plan. We are here to function and to operate that plan. So when you ask the question, well, why does he still find fault? Oh, look, man, what in the world? Who are you to answer back to God? You see, he goes on to say then, the thing molded, the thing molded, we're going to see that again, the thing molded will not say to the molder, God is the molder, and you and I, as a human being, we are the molded. Why did you make me this way? He asks. Well, in verse 21, we pick up here now, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time uh, with the exegetical study and the grammar and the, uh, the, the Greek words here, except to say, look, we did this last week. If you need the time, you go back and read that again. Read all the Greek words and see what they mean. But the end result is this. The translation of that verse, Romans 9.21, would go something like this. Or does the potter possess authority over the clay? Now look here. God is the potter, and you and I are the clay. God is the creator. We are the created. Who among us? is willing and able to intelligently say, excuse me, who do you think you are, God? Who do you think you are to believe that you have authority over me? 
The question then is, does the potter not have uh, authority over the clay? From the same lump, from the same lump of clay, to make, on the one hand, a vessel for the purpose of honor, and on the other hand, another vessel for the purpose of dishonor. And the question of that, the answer to that question is, of course he does. If you had a lump of clay here, and you divide that thing into half, into two parts, you decide to make a perfect vessel, a perfect pot, capable of holding things. And over here, you create another one, and you make it with a crack so that it won't hold anything of no value. The question then is, if you are the potter, do you not have the authority over that clay? Of what, of what uh, authority does clay number two that has the crack in it look at the potter and say, excuse me, why did you make me that way? See, the issue is the potter has authority over the clay. And the potter, who is God, has the authority to make whatever he desires. So that if he wants a vessel of honor and he wants a vessel of dishonor, God has the authority to do that, and we don't have the right to question him. But we're talking about the angelic conflict, a battle between God and Satan that began in eternity past. And God created mankind to resolve the battle. Because when, 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 um, when Satan raised an objective objection that God wasn't being fair by sending him to the lake of fire, God said, okay, I'm a just God. What am I going to do? I'm going to give you time to show you why, in fact, you should, you should go to the lake of fire. So he created man. And right out of the, right out of the, uh, the gate, a little while after out of the gate, guess what? Adam and Eve both sinned. Now they're no different. They're no different from uh, from Satan who sinned. Lost beings now, depraved. And God had created man to resolve the angelic conflict, and He can't resolve anything now. But God foresaw all that and realized that in the prop uh, in the propagation of the the human race, dividing human history up into into ages: the age of the Gentile, age of Israel age of grace, age of the millennial kingdom, four different ages with four different sets of rules to live by. And God says, okay, now here's what we're going to do, Satan. These human beings are lower than you. They're not angelic beings. They're just human beings. But if these people that are human beings, lower, created lower than you, are going to be obedient to the plan of God, we'll show you that you as a higher creature could have been obedient and weren't, and I am, I am, uh, I am, have the authority and the right to send you to the eternal lake of fire. So the question here again in verse 21, does not the potter possess authority over the clay for the same lump to make on the one hand a vessel for the purpose of honor, on the other hand, a vessel for the purpose of dishonor? And the answer is yes, he does. So let's pick up now with point number four, because we had points one, two, and three related to verse 21, the last time we were together studying the book of Romans. So point number four, the lump, see, we see up here in this passage, it says, uh, or does not the potter possess authority over the clay from the same lump? There's that word for the same lump. Now, the question is, what is the lump? The lump is this. The lump is mankind's soul. Every human being has a soul. You are a human being. You have a soul. You are part of this lump. So consider yourself, for the passage of Scripture, consider yourself as a lump. Now remember, the previous verse say, uh, this verse says that God has the authority to make out of a lump of clay a vessel for honor and a vessel for dishonor. And the question is, what kind of a vessel are you? Let's, let's pursue this idea of the lump. The lump is mankind's soul. And here's the issue. As we pursue this, we're going to be able to resolve this idea of the unfairness of God. I want really to go to heaven when I die, Lord. 
I realize that you have the authority and you may say, well, I want that person to be saved. I want that person to be saved. And you point a finger at me, God, and say, but I don't want you to be saved. That is not biblical. And when we understand this, we're going to be able to resolve that issue in our own mind and be able to resolve it for other people out here. So just understand this, that every human being has a soul and every human being is a lump. And what you need to realize is the lump is mankind's soul, and that soul, you must go down a little bit deeper to understand what the soul is. So these abbreviations that I have here on the screen, B, M, V, E, and C, these are the first, the letters, the first letters, the beginning letters of each attribute of the soul. The soul of every human being is comprised of five parts. SC, self-consciousness, that means you are aware of yourself. Mentality, that is where you do your thinking. Volition, positive and negative pole, that's free will. Volition, the capacity to choose for or against. E, emotion, both negative and positive. And the C is your conscience, where you have your norms and standards stored in your soul based upon what you believe to be true. So the lump of mankind is mankind's soul. So since you're a lump, you, uh, since you, uh, since you are a lump, you have a soul. Since you have a soul, you're a human being and you are a lump in this verse. Now watch this. The lump is mankind's soul and your soul is armed with free will. See, this is the angelic conflict and that's why God created us. Are you as a part of this lump, are you willing to take your free will and make decisions that are obedient to, the, to God's plan in order that the angelic conflict might be resolved in favor of God? I'll tell you, I've read the last chapter, and I know how this comes out. We are going to be winners, but the question is, what kind of a lump are you? Are you learning to be obedient to the commands of God for the resolution of the angelic conflict, or are you rejecting all of that? We'll see something about that in just a moment. So the lump is mankind's soul armed with free will. Free will is volition with two poles. To believe, see, when you're armed with two, with two poles, volition with two poles, you're armed with positive volition so that you can actually believe in Jesus Christ, but you also have volition that means that you could reject Jesus Christ. You see, mankind, you, me, we, us, we are free, negative volition, positive volition, we are free to go either way we want to go. With your volition, you can believe in Christ or you can reject him. Now, as I go down this list right here, I see that everyone online with me seems to be a born-again Christian. So you are a part of a lump that's actually honoring God. But if we're going to understand the scripture and understand how it is that the potter can take the clay and make a vessel of honor out of one lump and a, and a vessel of dishonor out of the other. So when you're taking, taking a look at Esau and Jacob, Esau is the dishonoring lump. Jacob is the honoring lump. Many in Israel were dishonoring lumps. Many the Messianic Jews were honoring lumps. We need to understand all that. So here's the issue. I've got three circles here. The outer circle is your physical body. As a born-again Christian, you are trichotomous. You have three parts. You have a body, a soul, and a spirit. Now let's take a look at that. The body, the, uh, the bigger circle, that's the body. The body houses the soul, and the human spirit of the born-again Christian. So if you're a born-again Christian, you have an outer body. You see that. You can't see the soul, and you can't see the human spirit, but you have one. You've got one of each. So the, the, uh, the, the inner circle inside the black, that light gray is the soul. The lighter gray in the, in the center, that is the human spirit. Now, what about that circle do you need to realize in terms of this passage? Your soul, not your human body, listen to this, 
your soul, not your body or your human, human spirit, is the real you. See, an unbeliever doesn't even have a human spirit. The body is just a shell that houses the soul. So what we need to realize is your soul, not your body, not your human spirit, your, 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 your soul is in fact the real you. When, a, when an unbeliever dies and goes to hell, the resurrection at the end of at the end of uh, uh, the end of the millennium, that's all there is. He didn't have; they don't have a human spirit. They have a soul and a body. The body is in the grave and it's lifeless, but the real person is the soul down there in in hell. See, you have a you have a body, soul, and spirit. He goes to the grave. The real you is your is your soul. That's, that's where you do your thinking. That's where you make your decisions. So this point says your soul, not your body or your human spirit, is the real you. You are the lump. And if you are the lump and the real you is your soul, then your soul and is, the real, is the real lump. The lump and you are the same. So you and your own soul have free will. Your free will is volition. Remember, this is the angelic conflict. We have to make decisions. So in this passage, you are the lump, you have a soul, and the soul is where you do your reasoning. It's where you make your decisions. And we need to realize that that fourth bullet point down here, in the angelic conflict, how will you use your free will? Now, as I look down this list again, I can't see anyone on Facebook. But if you happen to be a born-again Christian, whether you're on WebEx, Facebook, YouTube, wherever you are, if you're a born-again Christian, guess what? Guess what? You use your volition to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. You had positive volition when the gospel was preached to you, but you look over here and see somebody to the left or the right that is not a born-again Christian. What, what did they do? They used their volition to reject Jesus Christ as their Savior. Now, remember the context of all this. We're studying Romans and Acts at the same time. It's writing to the Romans here. Paul is the key figure in the book of Acts from chapter 9 down to the last chapter in that book. And what we see was Paul, he was hurting. He was hurting for the Jews who were, in fact, rejecting Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior. He realized that within a short period of time, we're in chapter 26 now, and there's only 28 chapters. So by the time we get to the end of chapter 28, the, the, the fifth cycle of discipline has occurred in Israel, there is no value to preaching the gospel of the kingdom. It is only the gospel of grace. And if a Jew wants to get saved today, they've got to believe the gospel of grace, not the gospel of the kingdom. So we have the full-blown church age by the time we get to Acts, uh, I mean, by the time we get to 70 AD. So in the angelic conflict, where, the, where I've highlighted there, in the angelic conflict, how will you use your free will? Will you use it to believe in Christ? Or you will, will you use it to reject Jesus Christ? Now, notice this. Going back to the history of what we've already taught, Esau and Jacob, Amenhotep II, Moses and Paul, they were all free to choose. Those Jews that Paul was, was hurting for, from Acts chapter 9 on, those Jews that Paul was hurting for, they were using their, their free will. They were using their volition to reject Jesus Christ by rejecting the gospel that was being preached to them. They're rejecting the gospel of grace or the gospel of the kingdom, but they were rejecting Jesus Christ. But they had free will to be able to do that. So on one lump over here, got people rejecting Christ. On the other, on the other, on the other part, you've got another lump over here, where the people are believing in Jesus Christ. God has the right to make a vessel of honor or a vessel of dishonor. He's free to harden the heart of one and show mercy to the other. But remember, in all of that, God is not 
creating that, he's giving man an option to believe or disbelieve to be molded into that vessel of honor or vessel of dishonor. Point number five. Now, let me go back here again. See, you were, you, you were or you are free to choose even today. Now, remember this. This is how the angelic conflict is resolved. This spiritual battle that millions of Christians don't even know anything about. The failure, the failure in our pulpits. Many people are struggling out here in life. They'd like to have some answers, but they're not getting them. And what, they, what they're failing to see is they, as a born-again Christian, sitting in a church building somewhere, going to church every time the door is open. They are worthless in the re resolution of the angelic conflict. They don't even know the thing exists. So remember this. This is how the angelic conflict is resolved. It's resolved choice. Which way are you going to choose? Now, notice in point five, the vessel of dishonor. Who is the vessel of dishonor? The vessel of dishonor is the unbeliever. Now, I want to show you, as we're moving through, through all this information, you may or may not have been under the ministry of people who are using the same kind of terms, the same kind of symbols that I do. That doesn't make them wrong. It doesn't make me wrong. What I need to make sure is that you who are following my ministry understand what it is I'm trying to teach you. So this, this R here, the word R refers to righteousness. Okay? Now here's the issue. The vessel of dishonor is the unbeliever who has minus R. And minus R rep, uh, represents self-righteousness. There's nothing about this thing, there's nothing in that about God. All about you. Remember SC stands for self-consciousness? And we, set, we showed you uh, a couple lessons ago where we had three different columns. We had the carnal Christian on one side, the experiential Christian on the other, and we said, here's, here's what Paul was doing. Paul was making decisions from his neutral soul, self-conscious. He, he used his self-consciousness to move in the, in the direction of Jesus Christ so that he became aware of Christ. His mentality was filled with human viewpoint. His volition was positive toward the gospel and positive toward the word of God. His emotions were positive. He rejoiced. He was at peace. He was happy. We find also that the, uh, the, the volition, positive and negative, positive toward the plan of God, negative toward, the, negative toward uh, the plan of God. You have that choice. Emotions, negative and positive. We find the conscience based on human viewpoint or divine viewpoint. See, the issue is yours. What are you going to believe? How are you going to build your Christian way of life? Your volition is the issue. But God has a plan whereby when you use your volition, you are either going to be molded in one direction or another. You will either be a vessel of honor or you will be a vessel of dishonor. When you find yourself making bad choices, you're a vessel of dishonor. God has the authority to make that plan that will mold you into something that cannot be used. He has the authority when you're positive to mold you into something that can be used. We are either vessels of honor or we are vessels of dishonor. Which are you? Now, notice that minus R. That minus R means negative righteousness. That is self-righteousness. And anyone who is on, who has is minus R, this, the unbeliever has no capacity to have plus R, God's righteousness. So in the status of minus R, you as an unbeliever are a vessel of dishonor. So the vessel of dishonor is the unbeliever with minus R, self-righteousness, and the vessel of honor is the believer in Christ who possesses plus R. We're going to see something about that plus R. You possess, if you're born again, you possess plus R, you, and that means absolute righteousness. That's God's righteousness, and he's given that righteousness to you because you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. So the vessel of dishonor is self righteous the vessel, the, ve I'm sorry, the vessel of dishonor is self-righteous. The vessel of honor is plus R, absolutely righteous. 
And that righteousness, here's a key word, that righteousness that you have as a believer was imputed to you. What does that mean, imputed? What that means is God credited your life, your status. He just wrote down in the book, this person has plus R. And what that means is positionally, you are now in Christ. The moment you believe, the Holy Spirit took you out of Adam, placed you in Christ, and we're going to see 51 things happen to you from the moment you believe. One of those is the imputation of absolute righteousness. So that when God looks down at you, positionally, he sees you now as good as he is. Therefore, because you have believed, you are now a vessel of honor. God made you that way. How did he make you that way? He had a plan. You chose in the right way. And every time you choose in the right way, he's molding you into something that he wants, something that is effective. Now, look at that again. The vessel of dishonor is the unbeliever who is self-righteous. And the vessel of honor is the believer in Christ who possesses absolute righteousness that was imputed by God the Father to you the moment of spiritual salvation. Now, several bullet points here. You see, every human being is born status of minus R. Oh, oh, listen to that now. You're not born physically, and then later you choose to sin and become unrighteous. Oh, because Adam sinned in the garden along with Eve, thrown out of the garden, began to procreate every human being that came from the loins of Adam and Eve. Guess what? You are, you possess minus R, you are self-righteous, you are, you are in a condition of being lost, set up to become a vessel of dishonor when you hear the gospel. So every human being is born with the status of minus R. So if you know an unbeliever out here right now, they have the status of minus R. The best they can offer God is self-righteousness. and He rejects all that. Second bullet point, rejecting Christ at the point of gospel hearing is the vessel of dishonor. So you are an unbeliever the moment you're born physically, but when you hear the gospel and you reject it, you become a vessel of dishonor in the angelic conflict. Third bullet point, every born-again Christian receives plus R, absolute righteousness at the moment of salvation. Now the question is this. How did you receive that? Well, you believed in Jesus Christ. You believed the gospel, and God's righteousness saw that decision, and the justice of God imputed to you, credited to your account, absolute righteousness. Fourth bullet point, receiving the absolute righteousness, plus R, through imputation is tantamount to being a vessel of honor. So when, a, when an unbeliever rejects the gospel, immediately they become a, a vessel of dishonor. But you, as, a, as, a, as an unbeliever, you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. He imputes, God imputes his righteousness to you. So positionally, you are as good as God is good. And now you are considered a vessel of honor. Question, are you a vessel of honor? Or are you a vessel of dishonor? Have you believed or have you rejected? Jesus Christ the Savior. Point number six. Therefore, based on what we said, honor is possessing the righteousness of God. That's plus R. But you also have something else. The moment you believe in Jesus Christ, not only does God impute his absolute righteousness, his goodness, his perfect goodness to you, you also have eternal life which means you couldn't lose your salvation if you desire. For all those friends of mine out here who believe you can lose your, lose your salvation, or you can't be saved if you're not living for Jesus Christ, realize this, the moment you believe, you receive eternal salvation, but that is not the end of the Christian life. God also has more than salvation for you. He has blessing in time and reward in eternity, and the reward in eternity will glorify God throughout all of eternity future. 
So you see, if all you do is get saved and then go back into the same old lifestyle, you're still saved, but throughout all of eternity, you have nothing to honor God throughout all of eternity because you did nothing in time after salvation to earn the rewards that God has given to you past and is waiting to distribute them at the beam of seat of Christ right after the rapture so therefore you have you, you are a vessel of honor having absolute righteousness and eternal life while the dis while dishonor is what is that dishonor is functioning in life with dependence upon your own self-righteousness Look what I did. I quit this. I quit that. I don't do this. I don't do that. Makes no difference. You're still self-righteous. You have, you have no imputed righteous, righteousness, and you are headed to the lake of fire until you, after having rejected the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, this first bullet point, vessels of honor, again, a vessel of honor has imputed righteousness. This is righteousness, God's goodness, that he gave to you because you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. Second bullet point, vessels of dishonor have minus R. That's self-righteousness. So you either have self-righteousness, believer, or you have absolute righteousness imputed to you at the moment of salvation because you believe in Christ. Now, all of this has a relationship to Paul's Disappointment in Israel. Okay, point number seven. God is free to bless the vessel of honor. Now, hey, listen to me now. God is free to bless the vessel of honor. Now, you have to know what the vessel of honor is. It's the person who possesses God's righteousness, plus R. And at the same time, God is free to curse the vessel of dishonor. All they have is self-righteousness. So God can bless the one, and he can curse the other. Who are these? Vessels of honor are blessed of God. Vessels of dishonor are cursed by God. Now stop here, and let's consider some principles, for example. We're still in, in Romans chapter 9, verse 21. There's an analogy here. There is an analogy. Romans 9, 21. By analogy, Paul is going to answer the question that was raised in the previous verse. Question. Why have you made me like this? Oh, wait a minute, old man. Just say, who do you think you are? The question. The potter. Who are you, man? To question God. When you say, oh, excuse me, why have you made me like this? Well, the answer to that question is found in the fact that, listen, the answer to that question is found in the fact that the lump of clay, that's you, that's me, that's him, that's her, that's we, that's us, human beings. The answer to that question, why have you made me like this, is found in the fact that the lump of clay has human volition. Oh, yeah, there it is. He makes... Two human beings, both have volition, free will, self-determination. You can choose one way or another. Remember, this is the angelic conflict. Gospel message, there is Bible doctrine after you become a born-again Christian. The question is, how are you going to respond to God's plan for the human race in the resolution of the spiritual battle called the angelic conflict? So the answer to the question, why have you made me like this? That question is found in the fact that the lump of clay, we, we, us, we have human volition, which means we have free will, we have self-determination, and God has a plan out here. What are you going to do with it? So let's take a look at these bullet points. See, you, in this analogy, we got a lump of clay, but by analogy, you, I, we are the lump of clay. Because we have lump, because we are the lump of clay, human being, you have free will. You have a soul. The soul is the real you. That soul has volition. Volition has the capacity to choose for or against. The issue is for the gospel, against the gospel. For doctrine, against doctrine. 
you have free will and free will is self-determination. You can go either way. You can go any way you want to. See, mankind will determine, mankind will determine one way or the other. Mankind, people, human beings, you and you, you will determine one way or another. Will you believe in Jesus or will you reject Jesus Christ? Believe him, that's positive volition. Reject him, that's negative volition. The choice is ours. Now, when you take that and look out across the across the planet, you see how many different religions are there. I'm not talking about Christian religions. I'm talking about religions other than this so-called Christianity. Christianity is a real thing, but Christianity is not a religion. But we have all kinds of religions out here, man by man's effort, efforts, trying to please God. Well, here's the issue. Man is a free agent, point number three, with freedom to function under his or her own self-determination. There it is. You're free. You can do whatever you want to. You're a lump. You're part, you're, you're part of the clay. You have a soul. You have volition. You can think whatever way you want to. You can choose whatever way you want to. But as a free moral agent, you have to realize that all of that is related to the resolution of the angelic conflict, whether you've heard of the conflict or not. So man is a free agent, is a free agent with freedom to function under his own self-determination, the negative volition, for better or worse. Look at the two bullet points. Positive volition represents for the better. When you are positive toward the plan of God, that positive volition represents the better. Positive volition is better toward the gospel. You are better off with positive volition toward the gospel. You receive salvation. Positive volition at the hearing of phase two doctrine. The Christian way of life is not over when you get saved. God has a plan for your life to, to take you from babyhood to spiritual maturity. The more you grow, the sharper is the sword of your life. Remember, the word of God is alive and powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword. The word of God cuts through the lives of people who are rejecting him. So here's the issue. Positive volition at the point of gospel hearing, that's better. Positive volition at the hearing of phase two doctrine, better. But negative volition is for the worst. Negative volition toward the gospel hearing, you're an unbeliever. You're headed for the lake of fire. Negative volition at the point, this is a believer now. Negative volition at the hearing of phase two doctrine, the worst. So there is better and worse. Positive volition is for the better. Negative volition is for the worse. But here's the issue. Positive and negative toward what? The gospel, first of all. Secondly, the word of God for a moment by moment living. Point number four. Volition, free will, self-determination. Those three, those three terms, they are, a, they are related to one another. Volition, free will, and self-determination are fundamental to resolving the angelic conflict. See, if the conflict is going to be resolved, man has to have volition. And guess what? Volition is freedom. Volition is freedom. You're free to do this or you're free to do that. You're free to do the right thing. You're free to do the wrong thing. Freedom is the most fundamental principle of all human history. And guess what? We better wake up in the United States because the United States as a client nation today, the pivot is shrinking, 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 shrinking. And when it gets to a certain point, God will destroy this nation, client nation gone. I just, it's hard to believe. It's hard to believe that we're that close. So what happens is the pivot, people like you and me, we need to be growing and growing and growing and witnessing and witnessing and witnessing, not just by opening our mouth, that's part of it, but it's by your lifestyle. It's your lifestyle. So volition, is, volition free will, self-determination are fundamental in resolving the angelic conflict. Why? 
with your volition, with your free will, with your self-determination, you're going to determine, are you going to be a vessel of honor or a vessel of dishonor? See, God permits mankind to use his free will to determine the issue of whether you, I, we, they will be vessels of honor or vessels of dishonor. And a vessel of honor resolves the angelic conflict and dishonor fails in the angelic conflict resolution. That's why we're here. Five, in the context of Roman nine, Romans 9, the, from the function of human volition, say, so, okay, we're studying Romans chapter 9 right now. Okay, there it is, We've got chapter 9. Just looking at chapter 9 in the context of that chapter, we're learning that from the function of volition, yours, mine, ours, theirs, from the function of human volition, comes a vessel of honor, positive volition, and a vessel of dishonor. Just a matter of choice. Point six. One person becomes a vessel of honor because of what God does for him. Now listen to this, please. When you become a vessel of honor, as opposed to a vessel of dishonor, you become a vessel of honor. Why? Because of what God does for you. Hold it now. You become a vessel of honor because of what God does for you at the point of spiritual salvation. And it doesn't end there. You are a vessel of honor not just because of what you believe or at the point of salvation, but also what you believe after salvation. Look at the point. Look at the two bullet points. At the point of salvation. The believer receives imputed righteousness. He, God's plan says, look down here. He says, the moment I see you believe in my son, Jesus Christ, I'm going to take you from being a vessel of dishonor to a vessel of honor. I'm going to impute my absolute righteousness, my goodness. I'm going to credit that to your account. So at the point of salvation, you need to understand, if you've never understood it before, if nobody ever told you before, you can walk around with your head up high without regard to your past, without regard to your past. Look at the Apostle Paul, good grief. When you understand his lifestyle before he was saved, hmm, at the point of salvation, you, the believer, you as a believer, you received God's imputed righteousness. You are now in his sight as good as he's good. Experientially, you're not. But it's the imputed righteousness that makes you a vessel of honor. Now, the reception of imputed righteousness, that's our, at the point of salvation, actually creates you as a vessel of honor. So now tonight, if you never knew this before, look up. You're saved. You have believed in Jesus Christ. Forget the past. You are a vessel of honor. Jesus Christ paid the penalty for your sins. You believed in him, and God cast your sins as far as the east is from the west, never to remember them again. Never. And you've received imputed righteousness, and you now are a vessel of dishonor, without regard to what the past was like. Point number seven. Another person is the vessel of dishonor, and here's what happens. The vessel of dishonor is functioning on Negative volition. Negative volition toward the gospel of Jesus Christ. So the other person is the vessel of dishonor, and here's what happens. The justice of God looks down, sees that negative volition, and what? guess what happens? Justice has to condemn that individual. Justice is going to do one or two things. Justice is either going to bless your life or curse your life. As an unbeliever, you will be cursed. As a believer, you will be blessed. Look at the four bullet points. Negative volition of the unbeliever, negative volition of the unbeliever, what does that mean? That means that unbeliever has rejected Jesus Christ as Savior. The gospel has been preached. They hear it. They understand it. They said, no, that's not so. That's exactly what the Jews were doing, who were the unbelieving religious Jews, that were persecuting Paul. 
They were unbelievers. They were religious. They were self-righteous. And Paul is preaching the gospel, and they are negative toward that. They're rejecting it. And as a result, they are vessels of dishonor. So, bullet point two, rejection of Christ creates the vessel of dishonor. Now, I ask you a question at this point, not on the, not the notes. I ask you a question. If rejecting Jesus Christ as Savior is a vessel of dishonor, how many vessels of dishonor do you think there are on planet Earth right now? Negative lesion, bullet point three. Negative lesion of the believer. So now we have negative lesion of the unbeliever being a vessel of dishonor, but it's possible to be a vessel of honor having believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, but multitudes and multitudes and multitudes of Christians are negative. They're rejecting doctrine after salvation, which ultimately, because of rejecting doctrine, it leads you in a path away from the plan of God for your life, that reversionism. Reversionism. It means you're, you as a believer are going away from the plan of God. Listen, and negative lesion, fourth bullet point, negative lesion toward doctrine after salvation is dishonorable to God. Point eight, honor or dishonor is not a behavior pattern. Say, oh, yeah, look, boy, they're dishonoring God. Oh, look, look, I can't believe how they're dishonoring God. Look what he did. Look what she did. Look what they're doing over there. Hold it now. Hold it. Biblically, honor or dishonor is not, N-O-T, a behavior pattern. It's not what you do. It's not what you did. No. Honor or dishonor is not a system of, it's not a pattern of behavior. It is not a system of morals. Oh, how immoral you are. No, it's not a system of morals. It's not even a system of self-improvement. Oh, I'm going to do better this next time. I'm, oh, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to struggle. I'm really going to do good this next time. No, it's not, it's not a behavior pattern. It is not a system of morality. It is not a system of self-improvement. Honor or dishonor is an attitude. Right up here. Honor or dishonor is an attitude. Attitude toward what? First of all, toward Christ as the living word. Jesus Christ is the living word. The Bible is the written word. What happens is, you, depending on what your attitude is, oh, it's one of acceptance. It's one of rejection. rejection. What is it? Your attitude, first of all, toward the living word, what do you think about Jesus Christ? What do you think about the person and work of Christ on Calvary's cross? can be one of acceptance or one of rejection. Now that you're a born-again Christian, you are to grow in Christ from, from babyhood to spiritual maturity, to sharpen, your, sharpen your, your life when you're witnessing out there in the public square, bringing about salvation to people who are lost to resolve the spiritual battle called the angelic conflict. After salvation, millions and millions of Christians are negative toward Bible doctrine. The principles, the promises, the doctrines, the techniques, the rules for living. Negative toward, negative toward the living word. Negative toward the written word. You see, the attitude here, the attitude of the unbeliever is negative. The gospel is rejected. The attitude of the unbeliever is positive. If the gospel is accepted. See, the attitude of the unbeliever. Reject the gospel? No. But the attitude of the unbeliever is positive if the gospel is accepted. The unbeliever can go one way or the other. It's his, his or her choice. Now, a couple other sh short bullet points here. You see, the attitude of the believer. What about the believer here? To the believer, that's you, that's me. Our attitude is negative if sound doctrine is rejected. If you're receiving information it is biblically sound. Principles and promises and doctrines and techniques and rules for living, they're all accurate. You're given, you're given those from a pastor teacher. You're hearing them somewhere. And guess what? Your attitude is one of rejecting that. Guess what? 
you're, you are a vessel of dishonor. Second bullet point, the attitude of the believer is positive. So first of all, the attitude of the believer is negative if you reject sound doctrine. The attitude of the believer, you, is positive if sound doctrine is metabolized. You come to Bible class, not, not to me. You have to come to me. You have to be somewhere where you're being taught the entire counsel of God's word from a biblical worldview. So your attitude, if it's positive towards sound doctrine and you metabolize it and apply it, guess what? Your attitude creates within you a vessel of honor. Point number nine, the believer is a vessel of honor because of what God does for him. It's what God does for you that makes you a vessel of honor. While the unbeliever is a vessel of dishonor because of what he or she is doing for himself or herself. So let's just take, let's just take me. I am a vessel of honor because of what God has done for me. I believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know what God did for me? He gave me absolute righteousness. He credited my account with absolute righteousness, which makes me as good as he is good. I am now a vessel of honor. While the unbeliever, whoever they may be, is a vessel of dishonor. Why? Not because they have, they have received what God's done for them. God hasn't done anything for them because he can't because they've rejected Jesus Christ. So what they're doing, they are a vessel of dishonor because of what they're doing for themselves. Negative volition toward the gospel. So here's the issue. A vessel of honor is a, a vessel of honor is a believer. God the Father does for a new believer what he or she cannot do for himself or herself. Going to do for you. When you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, God is going to do for you something that you cannot do for yourself. You cannot make yourself positionally righteous. You can't do it. Third bullet point. A vessel of dishonor is an unbeliever. Why? You see, what happens is the unbeliever elevates his or her volition. Woohoo! Yeah, my choices. You elevate your choices over the sovereignty of God. God's sovereignty places him in command. He is the potter. He's the one that's doing the molding. He is the creator. We are the created. We have no right to challenge God. We have no right to challenge his authority. We have the right to reject him or accept him. That's your freedom. Freedom is the most fundamental principle of all of human history. Freedom is required to resolve the spiritual battle called the angelic conflict. For example, today again, harking back to contemporary times, when you take a look at what the left, the political left, the socialist, the communists, those who are anti-Constitution, those who are anti-Bible, they're looking to take your freedom away. Oh, I want my freedom. I want my freedom. Why do you want your freedom? Oh, I want to make a million dollars. I want to find a wife that will make me happy. I want to do, excuse me, positive volition is to be, to be used toward the, the word of God to become what God wants us to be, to resolve the spiritual battle called the angelic conflict. Either do that and be blessed in time and rewarded in eternity, or you fail to do that, and with your own self-righteousness, just create your own misery in life. That's why I say the angelic conflict is the only thing, understanding that is the only thing that makes any of this make sense. So the unbeliever is going to elevate his or her volition above the sovereignty of God. I believe I'm more superior. I'm superior to you, God. And the unbeliever substitutes his or own his or her own self righteousness. Oh no, I, I don't care. I don't care for your absolute righteousness. I don't care for that. Satisfied with my own self righteousness. Minus R. Look here. Remember this. Minus R. That self righteousness is never equivalent to absolute righteousness. And it takes absolute righteousness to be a vessel of honor, see blessing in time and reward in eternity. 
for those who are functioning in minus R as unbelievers, negative toward the gospel, guess what? Your life is miserable. And it will be miserable for eternity because you're going to spend your eternal life, you're going to spend your life eternally in the lake of fire, which is separation, eternal separation from the God of all creation. I'm asking you, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Point number 10. God is just. That word just, self, sovereignty, eternal life, love, justice, absolute righteousness. That fourth characteristic, sovereignty, eternal life, love, justice. Justice means the fairness of God. God is just. He can't be anything but fair. He is perfectly just. He is perfectly fair. Therefore, because he is perfectly fair, his plan permits the unbeliever and the believer to be molded into a vessel of honor or a vessel of dishonor. Remember, we're talking about Romans chapter 9, verse 21. God has the authority to make out of a lump of clay a vessel on the a vessel of honor on one hand, a vessel of uh, dishonor on the other. And how's he going to do that? Through the volition of man. We're going to choose our own way. Point 11. The unbeliever's failure in areas of sinfulness. So you're going to have a, a, an unbeliever who's going to fail. He's going to be, that person's going to be sinful. They're going to produce human good. They're going to function in evil. So the unbeliever's failure in areas of sinfulness, human good, and evil does not detract from what God has done for him, the unbeliever, through Christ's work on the cross. Notice this. God, or Christ's work on the cross was for every human being from, from Adam outside the garden down to the last person who will ever be born on planet Earth in the millennium. Jesus Christ did that work for everybody. But the issue is this. While he paid the price for your sins, you have to accept that. You have to believe that. So the unbeliever's failure, what is it? His failure in sinfulness, his failure in human good, his failure in evil does not take away the fact that Jesus died for every unbeliever on the planet. That's what he did on the cross. So let's take a look at those three areas. What are they? Sinfulness. That's anti, any mental, any verbal, any overt act that has as its source the old sin nature's area of weakness. Now, you may not understand that at this point in time. If you haven't been with me to understand the old sin nature and the area of weakness, the area of strength, the lust patterns, the trends, we, we, we are able to characterize the old sin nature. It has an area of weakness. That's where you produce personal sins. Good is produced in the area, in the area of strength. So human good is any act of goodness that has as its source the old sin nature area of strength. What is evil? Evil is any distortion of truth, no matter how slight the distortion. Millions and millions of people, including Christians, filled with evil thoughts. Why? Because their thoughts are distortions of truth. So point 11 says, the unbeliever's failure, I'm not talking about a believer, the unbeliever's failure in areas of sinfulness, human good and evil does not detract from what God has done for that unbeliever through Christ's work on the cross. All this sinfulness, human good, evil thinking, it does not take away, it does not diminish anything that Jesus did for them on the cross. Now let's take a look at some more principles in the last six or seven minutes. Some more principles. Number one, the omniscience of God. What is the omniscience of God? The omniscience of God is that part of his characteristic that knows everything from beginning to end. It no, listen, the omniscience of God knows reality, but the omniscience of God also knows probability. So the omniscience of God knew everything in eternity past. Everything. Not caught, the Godhead is not caught, off, caught by surprise by anything we do or say. So first bullet point. The, whole, the omniscience of God knew in eternity past, looking all the way down to today, 2019. 
knows who would say yes to the gospel. He knows that. He knows who would say no to the gospel. He knows who would be positive toward doctrine. The omniscience of God and eternity past knew who would be negative toward God, doctrine. So this is, it may be a surprise to you to find out uh, born-again Christian A and born-again Christian B over here are negative toward the plan of, uh, negative toward the gospel, uh, negative toward uh, sound doctrine. But the truth of the matter is, while that surprised you, that does not and did not surprise God. Point two, therefore, by analogy, in eternity past, when God the Father fed, fed mankind's positive and negative volition into the computer of divine decrees. See, every decision you made, every decision you make, past, present, and future, was already programmed into the computer. We call, It's an analogy into the computer of divine decrees in eternity past. So when God hits the print button for human history, comes down to the time that you are born physically, every decision that God the Father saw you make in eternity past, you will make in time. And he didn't he didn't program, I mean, he didn't he didn't twist your volition to be positive or negative. You did it yourself. It's just that the omniscience of God saw that. So therefore, by analogy, in eternity past, when God the Father fed mankind, yours, mine, and ours, positive and negative volition into the computer divine decrees, those decisions fell into many categories. Those decisions you made, those decisions I made, fell into many categories that would come out computer in human history just like they went in. So here's the issue. Point number three, for everyone who believes in Jesus Christ, Christians, everyone who believes in Jesus Christ for, for spiritual salvation, see you're believing in him for salvation, you were an unbeliever, you believe the gospel, you get saved. The printout in human history includes these three things. Because you believe in Jesus, your printout includes election, foreknowledge, and predestination. Ooh, those are big terms. I wonder what those mean. Let's take a look at all three of them here very quickly. Election. God chose. See that word elect. Oh, I elect. I elect. I choose. God chose you in eternity past. Not because he said, oh, let's see, uh, I don't care what they're doing. I, I want that one over there. I want this. No, 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 no. God chose you in eternity past because you chose Jesus Christ during history. The omniscience of God saw you believe in Christ. So in eternity past, God the Father saw you believe in time, and he placed you as a born-again Christian in the computer divine decrees, and he gave you election, which means election includes both equal privilege and equal opportunity. If you are a born again Christian, you have equal privilege and equal opportunity. Every believer has the same. Black, white, rich, poor, educated, uneducated. You have equal privilege and equal opportunity as a born again Christian. Equal privilege and equal opportunity and in your royal priesthood. Your royal priesthood is you're representing yourself before God. You have the freedom to represent yourself under election you have equal opportunity. And that equal opportunity is to use the logistical grace support that God gives you. God has already provided everything you need, I need, we need to move from, from babyhood all the way to spiritual maturity. It's out there. We have to use our volition to get there. Now watch this. We're going to have to close here in a minute. Election foreknowledge and predestination went into the printout in human history. G God saw you believe in Jesus, so he elected you. Foreknowledge is an, is an issue. Predestination. What is foreknowledge? God knew your decision. Foren I foreknew. I knew in advance. God knew your decision in advance that it would be positive. That's why Romans 8.29 says, for those whom he foreknew. He knew, he knew you would believe. Okay, now watch this. Those whom he for new, he also did something else. He predestined you. That word predestined doesn't mean he chooses you and doesn't choose that one. To de What that word predestination means, it means foreordination to determine something ahead of time. Listen, let's close with this. What did he, what did he choose and foreordain 
in eternity past. He saw you choose Jesus Christ, so he chose you. He knew you would choose, therefore he predestined you. And that means to determine things ahead of time. I, I, had the, I was going to put a couple more verses in there. That's why I put it in red. But I didn't go back and get them, so that doesn't mean anything except the fact that I didn't get the other two in there. Here's what it says, Romans 8, 29. For those God foreknew from eternity past, he saw you believe. What did he do? He predestined you. He determined something ahead of time, and here's what he determined. Listen to me, please. Here's what he determined. He determined that we would be conformed to the image of his son so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. What that means? That means right there that God determined in, in eternity past that because you and I and we and they would believe in Jesus Christ, he determined that we are to become exactly like Jesus Christ in his humanity. And because he determined that, he didn't determine something for us that we can't do. He determined something that is absolutely positive because he's prepared everything we need to get there. Corinthians 3, 18, and we close. He says, but we all, Paul is talking to Christians. He said, but we all, every Christian, with an unveiled face. You know what that means? Here it is. You're standing in front of a mirror, and you've got this veil over your face. And out in public, you've got this veil over your face. People see the veil. They don't see the real you. The veil is under the, the, the real you is underneath that veil. He says, but we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror. What that means is you look into the mirror, and the mirror is the word of God. The mirror is the word of God. So when you take the when you take the hypocrisy off of your life. You're looking into the mirror of the Word of God. Guess what happens? You look into the Word of God, and that's where the information is found. That's where the doctrine is found for you to be transformed in the likeness of Christ. And guess what happens? He says, the glory, beholding as in a mirror. What are you beholding in the Word of God? You're beholding the glory of the Lord. You see him for who he is, what he is. And guess what? Because you're doing that. You're looking into the Word. You're taking in the Word of God. You're applying the Word of God. You're metabolizing it. You're applying it at her. Guess what? You're being transformed, what? Into the same image. You're being transformed from babyhood, lessons, to spiritual self-esteem, spiritual autonomy, spiritual, uh, spiritual maturity. You're being transformed, and the end result is that you will be just exactly like Jesus Christ in his humanity, just as from the Lord, just as from the Lord, the Spirit. Let's stop right here. Father, it's our choice. It's our choice. God the Father has the, has the freedom, he has the sovereignty to make out of a lump of clay, a vessel of honor on one side, a vessel of dishonor on the other. But the way he does that is to have a plan. He created man with volition, freedom. And the question is, will we abide by his plan or will we go away? One way for a vessel of honor, vessel of dishonor, all of which is related to the resolution of the spiritual battle called the angelic conflict. I'm praying, Father, we will make the right decisions. Learn the word of God after having become saved. Go out into the, go out into the marketplace with a biblical worldview, giving people the word, give people the word of God, the gospel of the lost, and doctrine to those who are saved. Be a part of the resolution of that battle called the angelic conflict. And I pray this in Christ's name and for his sake. Amen. God bless you. See you this coming Sunday, either online or at the uh, American Pie Pizza on Mama Boulevard here in Maumel. Let me close all this down and we'll see you on Sunday.